and holy God, Jesus Christ, along with the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Amen. Good morning. A little wet out, but it's not too bad. Our gospel begins in this, this really beautiful place where two disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus, except they're not there. I mean, physically they're there, but mentally they're back in Jerusalem where three days ago Jesus died and the disciples are still there with him in the tomb. And you could tell that that's what they're talking about and that's the focus of their days as they're thinking about all of these things. They're talking about how they're crushed because they had hoped so much that Jesus was the one. They're talking about how some of the women may have seen an angel, but they had, no one has really seen the resurrected Jesus. They're talking about being deceived and feeling disappointed. And you get the sense that this is the consuming focus of their lives. For whatever reason, these two disciples have decided to move on from Jerusalem, but all the rest are back there. And it's interesting because these guys can't really move on. And I've been there, maybe you've been there as well, where there's something from your past, or many, many things from your past, that just kind of stick with you in the present moment. Where something, either that happened this morning, or something that happened a long time ago, is still part of what gives us this moment right now. For example, maybe there's something that someone said to you that still kind of gets to you. Or maybe there's an opportunity and you're obsessing about something that you lost, a job you didn't get. Or maybe there was a game that you didn't win. Or maybe there's that one date at, that you got stood up for. I can still remember, it was 1992. I don't remember her name, but I waited for like an hour in the cafe and she never showed up. And these things kind of still live with us today, these small things, but also some big things as well. And I read about something this week that I want to share. There's a story from a preacher named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was very popular in the last century. Dr. Jones, uh, back in 1930s, gave a sermon at a church in Wales, which is where he was from. And the preacher was, was talking among the congregation. He gave a great sermon. And a couple of the ministers from the congregation came up. And they said, uh, can, you, can you do us a favor? We have a schoolmaster who's a member of our congregation who's going through a really difficult time. And we wonder if you could talk to him. And the preacher said, yes, I'd be more than happy to talk to him. So the preacher set up a, a meeting to sit down with the schoolmaster. And the schoolmaster came and sat down. And the preacher right away could tell he was depressed. Tell me, the preacher said, what is, what's going on? What's your trouble? And the schoolmaster complained of the headaches he always had, the stomach aches that he had, that his nerves were shot. And how long has this been going on, asked the preacher. And the schoolmaster said, since 1915. So it had been maybe 15 or 20 years. And the schoolmaster began to tell his story which was that when World War I broke out in 1914, the schoolmaster enlisted in the British Navy. And he was assigned to a submarine, and the submarine was sent to the Mediterranean. And there, while they were on patrol, they hit a mine, and the submarine sank to the bottom of the sea. And the schoolmaster said since then, he had never been the same. And the, and the preacher said, well, tell me more. And then the, the schoolmaster said, that's it. There's no more to the story. And the preacher said, well, there's got to be more. And the schoolmaster said, that's all. My life ended. At that moment, we went to the bottom of the sea. And the, school and the preacher said, but are you still there? Because he could see that the man physically was in front of him, but he knew that emotionally he was still stuck in that place at the bottom of the sea where he had been for 15 or 20 years. And the preacher asked him, well, why didn't you tell me as we talked about the rest of the story, why didn't you tell me that how you came up to the surface, that somewhere someone on a ship saw you, they brought you into their ship, they brought you back to England, they sent you to a hospital, why did you stop at the bottom of the sea? And it was for the schoolmaster a very profound moment. He had an insight into the fact that he was stuck there, and according to the preacher, at this moment his life got better. And he was able to let go of that and he was able to move on and he actually became a, a clergy person in the Anglican Church in Wales. And the preacher tells this story as a way of illustrating the mindset of these two disciples as they walk along 
the road to Emmaus. That just like this schoolmaster, there, there's something that's trapping them. There's like a dam inside them that they haven't been able to get beyond. But that their dashed hopes and their disappointment are all that they see. And they can't even see that Jesus Christ is right there with them. Jesus told his disciples repeatedly that he would go to Jerusalem. And that he would be arrested and he would be tried and he would be crucified and he would die and he would bury. And perhaps these disciples walked out of the movie at that point. Perhaps they just stopped paying attention. But for some reason they didn't really get the rest of the story. That Jesus also said that he would rise on the third day and that his victory, his resurrection would be a victory over death. And it would cause us to live a new life and that it would have all sorts of changes over the powers of evil. But these two fellows, as they walked along, didn't see any of that. They were stuck. We get stuck. We get trapped in certain places in our life. We are fixated on things. And just like them, we are so often unable to see the presence of Jesus. There are not a lot of times in the gospel when Jesus gets upset, but this is one of them. He says that they are foolish. He calls them slow of heart. And we can understand that perhaps part of why Jesus is upset is that he's a teacher and he's been trying to teach them about the power of resurrection, but clearly they haven't gotten the message. But I think there's also something at, at hand as well, that Jesus is upset with them because they clearly don't believe what he has to say. Or they believe their own stories more than they believe what's right in front of them, which is what happens to us when we become fixated on these things. Because once we have a relationship with God, once a, once a person has a relationship with God and Jesus Christ, our life is this balance. And on the one hand, we've got God. We've got God who loves us, who cares for us, who lifts us, who moves us, who makes all these things happen. And then on the other hand, we've got us. And we've got ourselves and we've got the stories that we bring with us. And wherever we go, there we are. We show up and life is this constant balance between giving things over to God and working on things ourselves. And it's that part in the, in the serenity prayer, if you're familiar with it, between the wisdom to know the difference between what's mine and what's God's. And the problem always with this is that our side of the equation is just filled with us. And it's all that we bring to every interaction with God. Our fears, our assumptions, the fact that our stories don't end, but we're trapped somewhere back in 1992 when you're waiting for your date and she doesn't show up, or you're trapped at the bottom of the ocean, or you're trapped back at the tomb. And these stories that we tell ourselves are so much of us that we have to just kind of get over ourselves sometimes. I once heard a therapist say that the goal of all therapy is basically just to get over yourself. And it's not that we are not important, and it's not that we don't have a lot to say, and it's not that we are not incredibly valuable, because we are, but we have to remember that we are on one side of the equation, and that on the other side of the equation is the almighty power of God. I think the challenge that we face is that we've convinced ourselves that we are at a certain place and that our story has ended. But then we come to church. And this story we tell this morning is the story we've been telling for a couple weeks. It's the story of Easter. And the story of Easter is way bigger than the story we tell ourselves. Because the story of Easter is about the glorious and amazing power of God. The story of Easter is more grand and it's more expansive and it's more filled with promise than the story that anything out in the world can tell you. The story is this beautiful song. This morning, imagine, God is singing us the song of rain. And God is singing to us the song of flowers which are just beginning. And somewhere back in January and February, I just about gave up on the fact that, that it was still cold and still dark and I was ready to stop there. But as we go forward and we let God sing to us the song of Easter, we find that something amazing happens. The more we hear the story, the more we enjoy it, the more we let embrace it, and the more we let it wash over ourselves, 
the more we find that who we are is really not as important as this big picture that's going on around us. And Jesus Christ is the incarnation of Easter. So when Jesus Christ comes into our life, what he offers us is this opportunity to complete the story. Our story ends in glory. Our story ends well. Our story ends at a place of hope. Our story ends at a place of heaven. Our story is not all the resentments and the slights and the anger and the anxiety, all of these things that we have on this side of the equation, but our story is much larger in the presence and the form of Jesus Christ, who even this morning is here among us. Sometimes I think we have a really hard time acknowledging that. I know I do. And sometimes when I'm here at the communion and suddenly I can see that in this second, I'm here with the presence of Jesus Christ. Or sometimes when I'm talking with one of you and suddenly I can hear his voice in your voice. Or sometimes when I'm out walking around on a day like today and I'm able to look at these trees and these flowers and to think, you know, there really is a bigger story. That the part I play is really something small. We're just here to observe. And as we observe, we are here to sing. And as we sing, we are here to be lifted up. What I love so much about the Easter season is that every single day in these months of April and May, we are encountered, we are, we are met by something brand new. Something brand new. Jesus is here in the breaking of the bread. He's here in our prayers. He's here in our thoughts. He's here in our world. Perhaps it's as good a reason to come to church as any because here we hear these stories of love. And these stories that end well, for in God all things end well. And these stories that bring us to moments where in reality anything can happen. And it's going to be something good. So my prayer for us as we go forth today is that we will continue this story. We will tell it. We will sing it. We will worship it. And that we will see him. Often all we need to do to see him is just to let go of a piece of ourselves. And he will find us because that's what he wants. His story is a really good one, and it's one worth telling. So my prayer for us is that we will sing it, and we will hear it, and we will feel, feel it this day, and certainly look for him in the days and the weeks to come. Amen. For those of us easily able to stand,